Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So, this is one of those rare, glorious videos that you will look forward to where you don't have to look at my face. Um, so, it has occurred to me when I've, over these many years now of making videos about swords, um, that not everybody in the world knows the names of all the parts of a sword. Um, so, what we're going to do is we're going to go over two fairly common uh, types of medieval sword. At the top here, um, we've got a long sword, and at the bottom we've got a mesa or lang mesa, um, and I'll talk about each of those in a second. And we're going to just name the part. Your pointer for today, apart from being me, is going to be this bollock dagger from Todd, um, and I'll put a link below. The long sword being featured here is by Dynasty Forge, and again, link below. And the Mesa is by Lands Connect Emporium, again, link below. Uh, so we're going to look at these two swords. I'm not going to be talking about the dagger particularly today, although it is a very nice specimen, as you see. Um, and we're going to be listing the parts of the two swords here. Before we go through those parts, just briefly to state, so the reason I picked the longsword and the langmesser is you'll notice they have very different methods of construction. The longsword has a hidden tang, in other words, uh, I'll talk about the tang in a second, but um, you can't see any part of how the hilt is uh, attached onto the blade, whereas the langmesser actually has a full width tang, so down here we've got the edge of the blade carries on, and then it has rivets running through. Um, also, another reason why I've picked these two swords is they are very uh, prevalent. They're the two main types of sword, you could say, covered in the medieval treatises that we work from when we're reconstructing European medieval martial arts. Um, the Langmesser um, treatises really being the main source for one-handed sword use in the medieval period that we have until we get up to the 16th century when the side sword becomes more prevalent. And then the long sword is the sort of knight or man at arms, the gentleman's sword par excellence of the 15th century and really dominates the medieval treatises. Um, and that's what we have the most material for. Now, statistically, if we actually went back in time and walked around in the 15th century, you'd probably find that the medieval arming sword, in other words, the one-handed version, uh, so the short-handled version of the long sword, was probably the most common sword around. However, they're not very heavily featured in treatises, except for the use uh, of them with a buckler. Um, but nevertheless, the techniques for the Langmesser, at least probably about 90% of the techniques for the Langmesser, are pretty much directly transferable to the one-handed arming sword. So let's have a little go through the parts. I'll start off with the long sword at the top. So first up at the end, we have the pommel sometimes known as the pummel. Uh, so in English language, pommel and pummel, obviously in different languages you have different uh, words for it, but um, pommel in modern English is what we refer to this as. And many people make um, internet memes about these being thrown for reasons I won't explain here. Um, but in Old English, this was often called a pummel as well. So pummeling someone uh, has a similar, is connected uh, in terms of the uh, linguistics, the origin of the word, etymology, um, pummel and pommel are connected words. So pummeling someone is essentially hitting them with your pommel. Um, now this pommel is widely seen as a, a counterbalance. In reality, it's less that. It is slightly that, but it's more for fine tuning um, and stopping your hand from slipping off the end of the grip. You will notice that the Langmesser does not have an explicit pommel. It is shaped to stop your hand slipping off, but it doesn't have a counterbalance weight, but it does have a long grip, which acts, acts as a counterbalance. Anyway, back to the long sword. So this is a pommel, and pommels that have been around pretty much since the Bronze Age. Uh, so pretty much as early as, as long as swords have been around, you have pommels. Um, and we're just going to move around to the end of the pommel. And you'll notice on the end here, we have that there. Sorry, I used my dagger to point. It's a little bit difficult when I'm looking through the camera. And that on a traditionally made sword is usually where the end of the tang we'll talk about the tang in a second, comes through and is then riveted on the end here. In other words, peen. So you'll sometimes hear us referring to peening the end of the uh, tang. And that literally means it is either hot or cold. 
forged uh, or riveted down, hammered over so that the blade can't fly out of the grip. This is actually a nut, which is not totally unhistorical. You do find uh, nut construction even in medieval and Renaissance swords, although it is less common than the forged peened end. So I mentioned the tang. So the tang essentially is a part of uh, steel that is a, or iron that is attached to the blade and runs through the inside of this grip through the pommel and then as discussed previously is riveted or peened at the end here which squishes this whole construction together and keeps it tight. Something that people often don't necessarily realise is that they think that the entire construction is being kept tight by that riveting process. In actual fact, the guard is very often forged on first by having a shape at the top of the tang whereby the hole in the guard is quite tight on that and it is hammered down so that this guard should be tight on the tang before you even put the grip and the pommel on. But nevertheless, the grip and the pommel and then peening it at the end tightens everything up. And if this ever comes loose, you can fix that problem by hammering or re-peening the end of that and making it all tight again. Obviously, if you have a nut, then it's more a question of tightening up that nut to tighten the construction. And that is the, the nut is the more normal method found on uh, 19th century and even 18th century swords and um, sometimes on medieval and renaissance swords and on modern reconstructions they often use a nut because it's an easier way of being able to replace or change components uh, and certainly for training weapons uh, nuts are quite a good idea. So next up we have the handle or grip. Now uh, this is usually known as a grip um, I have seen some people get into a real, uh, get their knickers in a twist by the fact that people have referred to this as a handle instead of a grip. That's ridiculous. It is, of course, a handle because you hold it. Um, but nevertheless, these are normally known as a grip. And you essentially have a hole running all, right the way through the grip. Uh, so it's wood with uh, leather over the top. And very often it's wood with cord and then leather over the top. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and it has a hole running right the way through it where the tang, in other words the bit of the blade which gets thin and passes through here and through the pommel and is peened at the end runs through. Now there are a couple of ways of making that hole through the handle or grip. One is to make the wood out of two halves like a sandwich and form a groove in either one half or, eat, or both halves and then glue the two halves together around the uh, tang so that they uh, form a, a channel right, right the way through. The other way is to drill, so to get a solid piece of wood and drill a hole right the way through, which uh, is perhaps uh, easier in some ways and more difficult in some ways, has some advantages, some disadvantages. Um, and you can also burn a hole right the way through. With a grip this long, burning through is quite difficult. It's easier with shorter grips to burn through, but with a long grip like this you're going to have to drill most of it or make the grip out of two halves. Um, it seems that most medieval wooden grips were made of, out of one piece of wood rather than two pieces of wood but most wooden grips on modern replicas are made out of two pieces of wood because using modern machinery that's an easier and more reliable method to create the slot for the tang to pass through the grip. Now in terms of the wood, so obviously some swords do have a grip which is made just of wood with nothing over the top of it. Uh, an example would be a Scottish claymore of the 16th and 17th centuries which very often have bare wood grips with nothing over the top. But medieval swords usually have some form of covering over the top of the wood. Now a lot of people might think that's just to give a better grip on the, uh, on the, on the grip, <laughs> a better uh, hold as it were on the grip. Um, and that could be, well, that is part of it. But additionally, it also helps make the grip less likely to split in use. So when you're hitting things with the blade of the sword, you get a uh, shock, get, travels all the way down here, and uh, you can get the wooden grip, if it's just a bare wood grip, is likely to split and come off, and therefore your weapon might become unusable, which clearly is not a good idea in combat. Um, so 
What's a really good way of preventing that from failing on you in combat is to wrap something around the wood so that if it does split, at least it will keep together enough that you can keep using your weapon. Um, so for that reason, leather or cord or cord and leather together are very often wrapped around the grip. And very often uh, they would have been done with um, glue as well, so the glue adds to the whole process, a bit like making uh, sort of fiberglass in the modern world or, or um, something like Makata. So the glue kind of bonds with the cord and forms an almost plasticky sort of um, uh, kind of material holding the top level of the wood together uh, and absorbing some of the shock that passes down through the blade, through the tang and into the uh, or through the wood. Um, so the usual or very common method of construction for grips as found on things like Albion swords or indeed these um, Dynasty Forge ones um, is to have a wooden grip made of two halves glue those two halves together, slide them down the tang, then you wrap cord around the grip, uh, put glue around that so that's all very secure and the cord holds the sort of grain of the wood very tightly together and holds the two halves tightly together and then you put a thin layer of leather over the top of that cord which helps weatherproof everything and give a nice finish and a nice grip. Uh, and you also therefore, a byproduct of that is you end up with these little ridges you can see in the leather um, which give uh, obviously a better grip and those ridges are formed by the cord underneath the leather. But just to uh, point out that not all medieval grips are made that way, as I said, some are bare wood and some don't necessarily have cords, some don't have leather, some just have cords, some just have leather and others use other materials entirely. Some of them use silk cord and other types of materials like velvet and things like this. And some of them indeed have metal uh, sheet over the top of the wood. Right, onto the guard. So as mentioned, the guard is a, um, a bar here. This is known as one piece as the guard or cross guard. And individually, these are called quillons, okay? So that's one quillon, that's another quillon. It has two quillons. Lots of people in the world call these quillions. I'm afraid these people need to go and look at the word and read it out loud. It is not quillion, it is Quillon, and it comes from the French word quillon. Uh, so the French word quillon came into English as quillon um, and uh, eventually got more and more English sounding and became quillon. But it is absolutely not quillion. Okay, so please stop saying quillion. So one quillon, two quillon, pair of quillons, but collectively known as the guard. Okay. Um, uh, sometimes you have a uh, sort of section in the middle of the guard here which is a kind of block um, uh, but we don't usually find those medieval swords so I won't go into that here. Uh, there is of course a hole down here where my point is where the blade narrows into the tang and passes through the hilt as discussed and also as discussed and just to remind you this is usually forged down onto the shoulders of the tang so where the blade gets thinner to form the tang and pass through the grip. Those are called the shoulders of the blade or shoulders of the tang, okay, and they're here and they sit on top or slightly in a recess in here of the guard and uh, that is usually forged down onto those shoulders so this becomes secure and doesn't become rattly with use even though the wood might compress or shrink um, this guard should remain solidly on, which is why in museums when we see medieval swords that have been in water or rusted away or whatever, the guard, not always, but usually, is still secure in its place here, even though the grip has gone. So with many modern replica swords, if you take the grip away, the guard would fall down loose and kind of falling around. That doesn't usually happen with medieval swords because medieval swords, usually the guard is forged onto the shoulders of the blade. Now, before we depart from the hilt onto the, and move onto the blade, I'm just gonna discuss that word hilt. So hilt is a slightly problematic term because people have used it at different times and in different places, and even today use it slightly differently to describe slightly different things. So in simple terms, the hilt is all of this. It is all of the pommel grip guard. It is all of the hilt. So when I refer in my videos to the hilt, I'm talking about this part of the sword, everything that's not the blade, essentially. So um, all of this on the Langmesser is the hilt. 
and all of this on the long sword is the hilt. But where the confusion lies is that some people in some books and um, at various points in history have referred only to the guard as the hilt. Um, now, I think where this probably uh, stems from is that you could refer to that. That's the first part of the hilt, as it were, that you encounter as you come up the blade. So, uh, for example, the expression to the hilt, to run them through, to the hilt, uh, literally means to run something all the way up until it stops at the guard portion. So, um, whether it's a, a later period sword like a sabre or a rapier um, or a medieval sword, someone's not technically wrong when they say hilt and are referring only to the guard. But I think guard or cross guard is a more specific term, or indeed quillon if you're or quillons um, if you're referring to the guard uh, rather than hilt. And generally speaking, the hilt as an expression refers to the whole assemblage of everything you hold on to and the bit that protects your hand, regardless of what style of sword it is. So this is obviously a straight blade and is double-edged. First things to note, we have one edge, two edge, okay? Those are edges, and this in the middle, this groove, is called a fuller, sometimes also known as the channel or the groove. It is not usually known historically as a blood groove, but in the modern knife making world, these have become known as blood grooves. But as far as we know, they have absolutely nothing to do with blood. They're a way of reducing the weight of the blade without reducing its rigidity to any noticeable degree. Um, so they're a weight redu reduction measure and they can be wide and shallow, they can be wide and deep, they can be uh, narrow and shallow, narrow and deep, and you can have multiple fillers. So you could have three fillers, you could have two fillers. This just has one simple filler that runs for about two thirds of the way up to the blade. And after that, the blade becomes what we call flattened diamond section. So so that means that you can see here, we in the middle, we have something called the mid-rib. So this section down the centre here is known as the mid-rib. Okay, so fuller mid-rib. Uh, you more often call that a mid-rib if it's particularly pronounced. Uh, but anyway, this cross-section with four sides is known as flattened diamond section. Okay, so two edges, fuller mid-rib. Point. That's nice and easy to remember. That's simply called a point. And uh, this section here, as we come down from the centre to the edge, and from the centre to the edge on the other side, is known as the edge bevel. Okay, so in other words, it's the gradient between the middle of the blade, the centre of centre line of the blade, and the edge is known as the edge bevel. And obviously we have four edge bevels on a double-edged sword. In terms of along the length of the blade, these also have different names. The section around here is known as the strong or fort. Okay, the fort obviously is French, or fort is uh, French for strong. So the strong or fort of the blade, um, because it has the maximum um, leverage when it comes to resistance uh, against someone pushing against you. Obviously the end of the lever is the easiest to push aside. The base of the lever is the most difficult to push aside. So this is known as the strong or fort. Or fort. Um, and right at the base of the blade, down here, we sometimes have a blunted area that doesn't have any edge. And sometimes you'll notice that there's a little um, shoulder um, or, or sometimes known as a sort of plunge grind where the, where the edge bevel starts. If this has a bluntened section around it, this is known as the ricasso. Very particular word there, obviously Italian, ricasso. So if this is a bluntened section, particularly with shoulders and uh, pronounced beginning of the edge bevel here, then that blunt section would be called the ricasso. So we've got the ricasso, the fort, and then up here near the point, we've got a region called the foible or weak. Foible is an English word derived uh, or related to the word feeble, which means weak. Uh, and this is the weak of the blade, foible of the blade. Okay, so that is the, the part of the blade where you have the least resistance against someone pushing it. That's the fort or strong where you have the most resistance against someone pushing it. This area in the middle, we normally just refer to as the medium or middle of the blade.
Okay, there are some fencing systems which divide the blades down into many, many parts, but we won't go into that here. And then finally, for the blade, we have a region around here which is commonly known as the center of percussion. Now, that is a physics term which relates to the portion of the blade which exerts the most force on a target when swung. It's not the tip, it's not the fort. It's actually this region around here, and it would be similar to in tennis or uh, cricket or baseball, what we might call the sweet spot. The sweet spot of any lever, any stick, any swung object is, is usually around this third quarter of the blade. And there will be a particular point that it corresponds to, but equally there will be a region around that point where that is just generally known as the center of percussion. Okay, so point foible, center of percussion, medium, strong, or fort, and down here, the ricasso. Okay, and then we've got a fuller, and we've got a midrib. This is a tapered blade, and the tapered blade also has, you can see it tapers in this direction. If we turn the blade up that way, it also tapers as we go down that direction, and that is called distal taper. Distal taper just means that the steel gets thinner as you go down towards the tip. And this makes it light and nimble in use um, and makes it nicer to use as an actual weapon. Just briefly also, we should mention the point of balance, also known as the center of gravity. This is the point at which if you balanced either of these swords on your finger or anything else, that is the point at which they were balanced. It's very self-explanatory really, and usually on medieval swords, the point of balance usually lies in the strong of the blade around here. It's usually some number of uh, inches up from the guard, and usually balances around this portion here. In more cut-centric swords, the point of balance will be further up, and in more cut and thrust swords, the point of balance will be down here. And indeed, in later period, very thrust centric swords, sometimes the point of balance is very closely in front of the guard down here. And indeed, it's not always universal. You can have a good cutting sword that balances close to the hand, and you, can, you could, in theory, have a good thrusting sword which balanced further from the hand. Uh, but generally speaking, as a general rule, more cut-centric swords balance further away from the hand. And remember that the point of balance, as well as changing the properties of the sword, changes how the sword feels in your hand. So the further away a point of balance is from your hand, generally speaking, the heavier the blade Blade will feel, the more inertia it will take to move that blade around, um, and it will, generally speaking, cut better, um, but you will, um, with everything, it's a balance. What you gain in nimbleness and responsiveness, you might lose in cutting power. Just very briefly, we'll talk about the scabbard. The scabbards are made of wood, usually in two halves, sometimes more parts than that, but usually two halves, hollowed out each on one face and then connected at the edges and bound in leather. Again, like the grip, there are different ways of constructing them. The end here is called the chape, okay? Sometimes known as a drag in later swords, but we call that a chape. And that is a metal end protecting the bottom of the scabbard from knocking on the ground or knocking on stairs or other things. And, and obviously that would protect the point of your sword as well. Obviously against other people, you don't want the point of your uh, sword to come out of your scabbard and poke your friend in the leg. But equally, you don't want the point of your sword accidentally uh, poking out of the scabbard and hitting a, a, a stone wall and blunting the end of your sword or breaking it off. So that protects the end of your sword and protects other people and protects the scabbard. That is the shape. This is just the scabbard. And up here, this can be known by several names. Now, if there was a metal part up here, which usually on medieval swords we don't get, it's usually a later thing, then that would be called a locket. Uh, but in this case, we would normally just refer to this as the throat, uh, because obviously you stick things into it, like food. Um, not, don't stick food into your scabbard, that's a bad idea. But this is just known as the, the throat, usually. Um, these projecting bits which come up the side here when you sheathe the sword can be known as rain guards but usually a rain guard as it's referred to regard um, refers to a leather piece which is actually mounted on the sword rather than the scabbard right let's move on now to the langmesser so now let's move on to the messer or lang messer. So one thing I'll just say about this is um, before we go into the names of the different parts of the 
uh, sword itself is that there is a, uh, some people would say that's not a sword, that's a knife. Now this is not uh, a kind of play on um, uh, Crocodile Dundee or anything like that. It's the fact that these uh, Messer, for anyone who doesn't know, Messer in uh, German simply means knife. So actually when we refer, when Anglo speaking, English speaking people, Anglo-centric people tend to refer to these just as messes. Technically, they are referred to as messes in the treatises, but it's a very non-specific, it's just calling it a knife, which is obviously a very, very generic term. Uh, more correctly or more specifically, we would call this a lang messer, or langs messer, which means long knife. Um, and there are variations of this which have been variously known as Kriegsmesser, which would be war knife, or Grossmesser, which would be big knife. Um, now, you'll notice that the construction of the hilt is very, very different to the construction of the um, longsword, or indeed an arming sword. So instead of a through tang, a hidden tang, which goes all the way through and is peened at the end of the pommel, as discussed, Instead here we have a full width tang. I'll just pick that up to make it a little bit clearer to those of you who don't know. And there is the tang. So we can see the tang at the back and the front. Uh, now, confusingly, not all Messer have, um, have full width tangs. Actually, some uh, Messer are constructed with a hidden tang inside um, that is pegged through, much like a Japanese um, katana, wakizashi, or tachi, one of the, um, one of the Japanese swords, or, or indeed a tanto knife. Um, so not all of the things that we would call a messer, or a, a gross messer, or lang messer, or kriegs messer, not all of them have this exact type of hilt construction, but a lot of them do. So let's focus on this one for now. The uh, names of the sword are overall different from the of the arming sword or the long sword because of the different hilt construction and style and the fact that it is a single-edged blade instead of a double-edged blade okay with a correspondingly different shaped tip although it must be said that you do get messes which do have um, spear tips which are more like a, a double-edged sword but we'll come to the tip in a minute right so starting at this end um, you'll notice it doesn't have a pommel. Now some messers do have a pommel cap. So if there is a piece of metal going around the end of here, um, sort of like a cup around the end, we would call that a pommel cap. Uh, however, this um, sword does not have one of those. Uh, some messers do indeed have a pommel. They do have a metal um, plates on either side of the tang. So uh, the wood or horn or whatever this grip is made of would end here. And then you have a metal section connected on this side and another metal section connected on the other side. And we could call that a pommel. But moreover, just to confuse things, whilst this doesn't have a metallic pommel, we would nevertheless call this portion of the blade the pommel. If I hit someone in the face with that, then we would say that I hit them with the pommel. I wouldn't really say the end of the grip, I'd probably say I'd hit them with the pommel. So it, I think it's fine to call the end portion of a grip a pommel, even if there isn't per se a separate pommel there. This is the grip, but again, slightly confusingly, we refer to the grips because there are two grips that are not joined together. They're on either side of the tang. So we have a pair of grips or grip scales, these would sometimes be known as, connected on either side of the tang. These would be known as rivets. These are hollow rivets. That is, they're made of tubular sections, so we can see you can see through them there. Uh, that is a, partly a style thing. You could put a lanyard through if you wanted to, but I don't think that's what they're for. Um, but these can be solid or they can be tubular and they are nevertheless rivets. And they are holding by compression the grip scales onto the tang. And indeed, there will be some type of adhesive very often put between the grip scale and the tang. Um, the uh, guard or cross guard is in some ways like uh, any other medieval sword. 
Uh, we'll come to this bit in a minute. Um, but with this style of sword, instead of being put up from the tang end, it's actually put down from the blade end. So a little bit of a different construction method there. And you'll also notice it is not symmetrical because it is a single edged sword. So very often when we start to get swords that are single edged, the cutting edge is this side, this is blunt. So you can see blunt on that side, sharp on that side. Um, therefore the cross guard it can assume shapes that are uh, centric to one direction. Okay, so for example, you could have the knuckle bow could come down here to offer some, or rather the front quill on, could come down here to offer uh, um, a knuckle bow and offer some protection to the front of the hand. And sometimes you'll see the back one goes upwards. Okay, so that's one particular style of cross guard you see on certain types of mesa and falchion. Now, Let's talk about this projecting part at the side. That is called a nail or nagel, nagel in German. And that actually runs all the way through and is riveted on that side, pinning the cross guard through the junction between the tang, the full width tang, and the blade. So it's essentially like another one of these rivets, but the rivet holds the guard in place. Okay, so individually, once again, that's a quill on, that's a quill on. This together is a guard, it has a pair of quillons, okay? And that is called a nagel or nail. Onto the blade, so you will notice it has a cutting edge and it has a blunt edge, but when we get towards the tips, let's get my dagger again, it has a sharpened portion up here in a cusp. Now, this can take many different shapes. It could be a lot longer than that. It could have a bit of an edge starting down here. In fact, this one does have an edge uh, down about there. So the edge actually starts from about there, edged to here, edged around there, and then obviously edged all the way down the front edge. This is known as a clipped point, okay? A clipped point as you would find on something like a bowie knife, um, or indeed several other types of um, tool um, and knife and pole weapon even, okay? And what this achieves is it achieves bringing in a, a straight back edge and an almost straight front edge to a point, but whereby the point is more accentuated towards the front of the blade. Um, and this produces a nice convex cutting edge at the front, while still being able to have a point that is good for thrusting and penetration. Um, now this uh, kind of point is sometimes, if it's a bit more exaggerated than this, is sometimes known as a cat's claw in um, Spanish and Italian. Um, and, uh, but we would just, in English, we would just call it a clipped point, okay? And that is found on lots of Mesa and Falchion and things like this. So just like before, we have a fuller or shallow in the blade. You can just see there, it's a, a groove that it reduces the weight of the blade whilst not losing any of its stiffness. Um, and so that is called a fuller. It is not a blood groove, but we could call it a, uh, we could call it a groove or a channel. It goes by different names in different languages, but usually in English we would call it a fuller. Now a curious feature of the uh, Langmesser is that as discussed, we have a front edge and we do have a back edge, but only up here. Now this back edge, when it's limited to near the point, is called a false edge. You can see it starts there, runs up there and goes all around there to the point. And then we've got a long front edge all the way down the front. So we've got a true edge or front edge. So the front edge or true edge, and then we have a back edge also known as a false edge. But just to add another terminology into the mix, in German sources where these uh, Langmessers are most widely featured, the front edge on any sword is often referred to as the long edge and the back edge is often referred to as the short edge. Now, they even use this terminology for weapons like this long sword at the top here. So despite the fact that both edges are technically the same length, you would refer to hitting someone with your front edge as you're hitting them with your long edge and hitting them with the, your back edge as hitting them with your short edge. And this expression very clearly comes from this type of Langmesser, this type of weapon shown down here, where the back edge is short and the front edge is long. So your long edge, true edge, or front edge is the same thing, and your back edge, false edge, or short edge is this one.
Okay. Um, and just like with the long sword, we have the fort, the medium, the foible. We've got the point, in this case, a clipped point, rather than a spear point, which is symmetrical, a clipped point. And then right down at the base here, if we had a uh, more defined blunt region um, with a shoulder where the edge started, we would call this area here the ricasso. Also, with a single edge blade, we've got something we don't have on the double edge blade. We have this blunt back, and that is known as the spine of the blade, just like a human being or an animal has a backbone. That's what this is regarded as, and that is known as the spine of the blade. Um, the scabbard, the pretty much the same name of parts as the longsword. And we've got the throat. We would generally call that a chape, even though there's even no metal bit on it, but usually the metal bit would be called the chape, but there isn't one on this. Being a shorter scabbard, uh, there's less danger of that hitting the ground or steps or other things behind you. Um, and we won't go into the belt equipment for now. Um, but there we go. I hope that was a useful overview of the um, terminology for the different parts of medieval swords. Obviously, when we get into later periods, you get additional guards like the knuckle bow I mentioned. You might get something called a side ring. You might get something called a finger ring. So you start to get new additions to the guards and it gets more complicated into the development of what we would know as the swept tilt rapier or the side sword hilts. Um, and we won't go into those here, these just looking at the medieval swords. In terms of the terminology for one-handed arming swords, where the pommel would be here, um, it's very much the same as the uh, long sword. But these are the two predominant types of sword that we find in the medieval fencing treatises, the langmesser and the long sword. And I think I've pretty much covered the names of all the different parts. I hope that's been useful to you. And um, maybe I'll do another one of these videos for later period weapons at some point. Thank you very much for watching. And um, if you haven't subscribed, please give me a subscribe and a like. I've got extra videos on Patreon and I will see you guys soon for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.